What's up, Saints and Patriots? Apostle Claver, T. Kamau Imani of RagingElephantsRadio.com, the rebellious voice of Texas Liberty. I've been your host, your moderator for all of the conversations we've had for the Texas Nationalist Movement's Legislative Action Workshop. Um, right about now, if uh, you go to TexasNationalistMovement.me slash TNM, Law, L A W, that's the main webpage where everything you need to know about what's been happening with this legislative action workshop has been going on, including all the previous conversations. All the videos are posted there. We cannot emphasize how important it is for you to go and check out all the conversations and distribute them. You can uh, cut out uh, clips if you'd like. But more importantly, please absorb the uh, platinum level of information that was shared there over the last couple of weeks. And today has been absolutely fantastic to really cap off uh, what really has been something groundbreaking by the Texas Nationalist Movement, this uh, statewide video conference, even international, with some of the guests that we've had. And, and now we have State Representative Steve Toth that's with us. Uh, so happy to have him back under the pink dome, and we're going to have a conversation with him very shortly. We're going to take our time, and it's going to be a conversation. It's going to be enjoyable. That's that's the way Steve is. He is a conversationalist. Uh, just some house cleaning. Real quickly, guys, uh, for your information, at the bottom of your conference room screen, you're going to see a Q&A button. We're going to be watching that during the conversation. If you have any questions for Steve, myself, or anybody uh, over at the uh, Mothership in Nederland at TNM HQ, uh, you can put it in there. There's also right next to that a chat button for uh, the chat room, and you can interact with your fellow conferees. You can also post questions in there as well. We want some interaction uh, while this conversation is going on. It's, uh, it, it, it's going to be fun. We're going to enjoy it very much. Also, I uh, want to encourage you to download the Raging Elephants Radio app, something that I forgot to encourage you to do when we're having our previous conversation with the big stick, Jonathan Sticklin. Uh, Raging Elephants Radio, you can get it at your app store or Google Play. Uh, we attempt to be a trustworthy source of news information commentary from a Liberty Texas First perspective. Uh, and with that, let's go to the man from the woodlands, the man with many hats. I don't know, I don't know if Daniel was able to coax him uh, into doing a fashion show real quick of all the 12 yeah, hats. Yeah, we're not doing a fashion show, Claver. Now, you, you need a hat more than anybody. I, I have diminishing grass up here, but um, I think your playground's a lot bigger than mine. Um, I'm not gonna touch that. I, I, have, I, I have no retort. <laughs> How are you? I have no retort, Steve, man. It's great to see you. Good to see you, buddy. And even better, it's great to have you back under the pink dome. You. you never should have left in the first place, if you ask me. But you didn't listen to me. You don't want to listen to me. I didn't listen to you. Didn't you didn't want to listen to me. You didn't want to listen at all. I mean, we really could have used you in 2017. But where were you? <laughs> no, you had to run up there to try to, you know, get that De Washington Devil City stench on you. You would have been ruined forever. Thank you, Jesus. I'm glad you lost because now <laughs> you're back where you belong. I'm just telling you like a TI is. You know, you know what though? I'm, I'm seriously. I, I love the Texas House, and I'm just so excited to go back. And it's just, you know, I, I spent some time in Washington meeting with folks, um, gun advocacy groups, um, pro-life groups, and it's just a completely different culture there that is not at all close to what it is, like what it's like in, in Texas. Just, it's not. No, it's not. I mean, I've given counsel to others. I, 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 I love, and I still call him my friend, Randy Weber, but I think, I don't think, I don't know. I, I, I don't suspect that anything wrong is, is there's anything wrong with Randy. It's just that his inability to really do something for the people is so thwarted just because of the way the system is, just because of the seniority system. I mean, until it's, you gain it, you're- It's, it's amazing. You can't, you can't even, as an example, when you're one of 435, as opposed to being one of, of 150, 
even though you're, it, it's, it, it's not just the, the ratio thing of one to one 150 versus one of 435, but they can't even do amendments up there because what happens, the Speaker of the House will fill the amendment tree full of baloney amendments so that you can't put anything through. It's ridiculous. I'm glad you're here, man. I'm excited to be with you. Now, now, now look, if, if I had lived in your district, you know, I mean, I can't say that I would have voted necessarily for you to go to Congress because I didn't want you to go. And I'm, I am glad you're back under the pink dome. And I want uh, in this conversation, because we do have a, a, a good chunk of time, which is really great, but I want to get to immediately to the topic that uh, it's at hand. And then we'll talk about the nuts and bolts. Cool. You bet. Dome, and I want to talk about November 6th as well. I want to talk about what happened electorally, what the landscape looks like. You're very well versed and experienced on the ground when it comes to politics, and I want to get your feedback on yeah. that. But let's sure. talk about 2019, January 8th, the gavel goes down, and it's always a madhouse on that first day of citizens, perhaps even trying to do their citizen lobbying on that very first day <laughs> yeah okay? yeah um but sometimes in their zeal those with even the most earnest of intentions the, the best of intentions the approach may be put offish to those um that are in office they, they come with the attitude of look you know i pay your I pay your 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 you, check. I your, pay your six hundred dollars a month. You, you doggone right. <laughs> doggone, doggone it, doggone it, doggone it, right? Um, and 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 um, you guys do the best you can. Let's talk about as liberty movement activist, citizen lobbyist. What's the best way to really nurture a relationship with those that we already know are our friends, especially those that are allies, members of the Freedom Caucus? Steve, go right ahead. So. I, Claver, I've, I've, I've got a unique perspective on this because, you know, before I got elected to the legislature back in 2013, I was an activist. And then, as you stated, I served two years and then I was out in 2015. And for the past four, you know, for the past four years, three years, I've, I've been an activist again. So I'm back on the other side of the table and I can tell you what, what does work and what does not work. And what does not work is being a jerk. You know, it, it, you touched on it. Daniel has spoken about this over and over again. It's about relationships and developing relationships. And if, if it, it may be cathartic for you to go in and, and rip a state legislator a new one, but at the end of the day, get in line. You're, you know, you're, you're one of a three or 400 people, individuals, most of them Democrats, that will be ripping me a new one every day on social media, Twitter, Facebook, and um, Instagram and, and emails and phone calls and everything else. And it just becomes white noise after a while. And I've gotten to a point where even in my social media, um, personal campaign social media, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, conservative or a liberal, if you can't talk nice, I just, I block you. Um, I want to have a substantive discussion with people about the issues. And if you want to have a substantive discussion about the issues, then I'm all about it. And that's how most people are. They just want to, they want to really get into the, to the meat and potatoes of what, of, of what the issues are. So I would start by saying, be nice. My gosh, just be nice and develop a relationship. And Daniel did that with me. You've done that with me. Um, I, I think you had Dave Roberts on the show. Um, uh, did you guys have, did you guys speak with Dave as well? Dave Roberts? Yeah. yeah he, and he was, he was superb. Yeah. Dave, uh, Dave really, um, underscored the importance of what you're saying from an activist point of view. Dave, Dave knew that, that Texas sovereignty is a big issue for me, right? And so what did he do? Dave sent me his book. And late at night, I think it was, um, I think it was one of the earlier evenings that I got in. I think I got in around 2 a.m. And um, from the Texas House, uh, not the floor, but I, I'd come out of the Criminal Jurisprudence Committee and there was Dave's book on my bed. He had, he had sent it to, to my staff and one of my, one of my, I think it was my district director put it on my bed. I started reading it and I, I couldn't put it down. I, I think I, 
you know, concluded reading around nine o'clock. I'd read the whole book in one night. And, um, but that was the beginning of a relationship for me with Dave. And that's really how good relationships begin. Just reach out. It doesn't necessarily have to be about something that's along the issues of what you want to be an activist for, but just reach out and start developing um, the relationship. And um, I would say, don't get personal. Um, if, if you're getting, even if you're feeling frustrated that the, 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 the rep that you're talking to isn't, isn't um, um, there isn't a meeting of the minds yet, don't get personal. It just keep on developing the relationship. And I'd add one more thing, Claver. We're in this thing to win hearts and minds. Both of us are in this to win hearts and minds. And while you may say, you know, I'm going to stick with Freedom Caucus or I'm going to stick with conservative Republicans, not everybody that's out there in Texas has a state rep that's as um, conservative as I am. Mm -hmm. um, and um, or as liberty minded as I am. And so you're in this as an activist to win hearts and minds. And I, I would encourage you to start listening to the same radio station that I listen to, which is W I I F M or what's in it for me. And so start winning those state reps over. Uh, even if they're Democrats start earn the right to be heard and um, come in, spend time with them and, and um, uh, come to them. And, and come to Austin and spend time in Austin in their office and be a pleasant person that they can develop a relationship with. And then I'd start feeding them information. And Claver, you've seen this before. You, you'll, someone wants to, to reach you and reach out to you and they'll send you a 36 page um, um, uh, um, doctoral um, thesis that they think that you're gonna read through. Well, you've got 70 of those this week alone. And you, you don't have time never, to read through these things. Never, never mind the, the, the new 250 bills that just been filed in the last 48 hours. Um, yeah, that I'm supposed to read, right? Yeah, I can't right. even, I, I, I'm going to have a hard time just getting through the bill summary. So if you want to reach these guys, send them executive summaries. Learn how to write out an executive summary. Google search executive summaries and how to do that. Hold, hold, that, thought, hold that thought right there, Steve. There's something that I want to ask sure. you. All that thought about the executive summaries, but in building the relationship, you know, you were talking about the personal relationship. There is a way to be firm on an issue. Oh, absolutely. But, but, but still exhibiting decorum and respect. You guys do. Res you guys do want us to be direct with you. Don't beat around the bush, but do it with respect and do it with decorum. Right. Find something in what they're saying that you can agree with, that you can start to agree with, that you can start to build a, a sense of mutual respect and appreciation for the issue and build on it and, and, um, and just go, for, and, and go from there. And, and again, I, I go back to, you know, how do you, how do you eat an elephant? Well, it's, it's the old expression, how do you eat, eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Um, feed them information in bites. Don't give them a smorgasbord. Um, Feed them information that, that, and I, 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 I'll just be really brutally honest with you. I, coming into the state legislature has made me more liberty minded. It's made me more conservative over the years because people took time to feed information to me. And it's, it's changed my view on criminal justice. It's changed my issue on, on Texas sovereignty. It's, change my issue on what it truly means to be a limited government individual. Um, it, it works guys. It really does work. Okay. But Steve, I'm not going to let the office holders get away with it because they're all of them aren't as affable as you are. Okay. And, 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 and you say, don't make it personal, but even by some of their actions and statements on the floor, it's evident that, they make it personal. They right. do. So, now, I, I know, but the, oh, question, is, the question is, do you want to climb down into the gutter when they do that kind of stuff? I understand that. I understand it's, that. It but does no but good. Can, but, can, but can we at least have an acknowledgement that some of those guys that you, you would expect to have this statesman like George H.W. Bush, George Bush, the elder type of decorum, they are not necessarily exhibiting towards the electorate, whether their own constituents or not. Some of them treat right. their own constituents like right. You know, like uh, like camel fodder, man. Come on. 
No, I'm with you hundred percent. I get, I agree. The, um, we have to, as an, and I just say this, we, we have to rise above it. You have to rise above it. I have to rise above it. Um, that's just, it, it's, it's, it's just where it starts out. And then it concludes with, after you've built the relationship, you need to find your car and find a route to Austin. And you need to spend time during session. It's amazing, Claver, how many people um, advocate for legislation only to have their state rep go ahead and draft a bill. And then the bill is heard in committee and they don't show up. They just don't show up to testify and, and um, um, the, the bill is orphaned. And it, if, if you really wanna see things happen, not only you have to get in the car and come to Austin or on a plane, whatever, but you've gotta get your friends to show up as well. Okay, so, now I, I wanna talk about that because Rachel Malone did an exhaustive tutorial. Uh, I mean, um, really exhaustive tutorial on how to do that but I don't want to lose the executive summary point that you were trying to make and communicate right. to your state rep. Get back to that. So you should be able to in one paragraph communicate what, what you're trying to say. And at the very top of there's, there's a book that came out about 20 years ago, a sales book. It's, it's an, it was called selling to veto V veto V I T O very important top officer. And a, a state rep, um, is treated like um, this, the, the gov the, our constitution treats us like a part-time job. It's not a part-time job. I'm just here to tell you, it is not. It, it is all consuming. But at the same time too, we're expected to make a living and carry on a job. And so in the midst of hundreds and hundreds of pieces of legislation that we're looking at, an activist will want us to look at their issue. And so you've got to give it to them and in a paragraph that consists of maybe six or seven sentences. And at the very top, there should be a veto statement, which maybe it's, maybe it's a quote from, you know, you're advocating for border enhanced border security. Well, put a, put, put a quote in there from, from a border agent that um, maybe said something in the wall street journal or newsweek or on Fox news from the prior week. And, um, and then do your, your six, your, your six, um, sentence paragraph about why it's important that we enhance border security and what specifically you're looking for. Okay, Steve, another thing, when you're talking about um, building relationships, um, should we waste our time with Democrats? Yes. You're not wasting your time. Well, now, wait a minute. I mean, okay, so I'm looking at... Claire, let, me, let me give you, let me give you wait, a purpose. Hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm looking at Raging Elephant's Radio Liberty scorecard averages, and some of these folks, okay, because of their ideological leanings, and they seem to be dedicated to it. I mean, their scores are in the teens. They're in the same digits, okay? Yeah. I mean, uh, should we yeah. waste your time, or should we be focusing not, on... It's not a waste of time. I know. Not a waste. Some, of you, some of you guys live in house seats that are controlled by Democrats and you should still develop a relationship with these people. I'm telling you, Claver, let me give you a perfect example. I had a rep come up to me in March of 2013 and he said, I've got a bill for you to kill. And I said, dude, why don't you kill it? And um, he said, because it's one of my best friends, Bill. And so I take a look at this bill by Helen Giddings that the Texas Association of Business um, wanted her to carry. And I re read through it. The first paragraph talks about how important, um, um, how important it is that we maintain privacy um, at, uh, in the internet and, and how important it is that we maintain that. Well, you read into the second paragraph and what it talks about is, is a condition of employment for enterprise level corporations that you have to give your employer your username and password to all your email accounts, all your social media accounts. Get that, right? Does that sound very liberty-minded to any, anyone out there? Heck no. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? So no, I went to the back, Mike. Soviet, I went to the back, Union, Mike. Uh, Soviet Union, North Korea. Right. Yeah, um, exactly, dude. Right? So I went to the back, Mike, and I eviscerated that bill. And she was, she, she, she just hadn't looked at the bill. I mean, understand that 
there are legislators out there, they will carry legislation for groups and they'll never even look at them. And so I killed that bill from the back mic and um, she pulled it down. We rewrote it actually to strengthen privacy for, um, 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 for employees that are employed by enterprise level corporations. But as a thank you, <clears throat> that state rep came back to me when I was carrying the C-scope bill and he said, Hey dude, you got a, you got a point of order that's been placed in your bill. And I'm like, no, I don't. I, I, I've gone over the bill and he's like, Hey, look at, look at the house clerk and what they did when it came out of calendars. We looked a little bit more carefully and yep, there was a point of order there and we pulled the bill down, fixed it, put it back on the floor and it passed. Um, develop relationships. You're not wasting your time. Develop relationships with people. We're, Claver, we're in this to win hearts and minds, which means that every single person, um, it's an opportunity to influence them towards liberty. And um, it's not a waste. We're talking with State Representative Steve Toth. Um, coming up for the 2019 legislative session and, and building these relationships, right. um, what do you think the relationship is going to be between the new speaker and the grassroots? Is it going to be better than, than it was with uh, the soon to be former speaker of the house, Joe Strauss? I mean, there, there was yeah. quite an enmity between the speaker and uh, the rank and file of the Texas DOP, the delegation of the convention, if, if you will. I, do you anticipate better relations since we're talking about relationship? It can't help but improve. In fact, if you, Look at the speaker's, uh, some of his most stalwart supporters on the Republican side, they, they were all extremely disappointed in what transpired this past session. I mean, I, I talked to guys that said, hey, Steve, you know, I, I passed in um, 2015, 17 pieces of legislation. In this past session under Strauss, I passed none. And, and these are guys that, were, would be considered his lieutenants. So yes, I think that things will be considerably better. Um, Dennis is, um, Dennis is, it, it, um, came from the Republican caucus and the Republican caucus chose him. And that's, that's what we needed to do. And, you know, Claire, at the end of the day, I just need fair. That's all I'm asking for. Just give me a fair speaker that allow my legislation to come to the floor I'll take it from there. Um, we've got the votes to pass conservative legislation. We've got the votes to pass liberty-minded legislation. We've got um, the votes to pass legislation that um, protects life. We've got the votes that will, will ensure that Texas is a more liberty-oriented government that is smaller and less intrusive. We've got those votes. We just need a, a speaker that's not antagonistic towards them. Okay, so I, I asked this question of the big stick who came on prior to you. I think it's only fair to, to, to ask you. Um, one of the things that stuck in my cross uh, during the Strauss regime was his promise to continue to appoint one third of committee chairs to, to Democrats. In some cases, the entire power structure, chair and vice chair to be Democrat. Do you think that's going to continue under Speaker Bonin, or is it going to reduce to some issue? I, I think the Ameri I think the Texas people. Wait a minute. Party you, hold on. You started with the premise that Strauss only gave a third of the committee chairs to Democrats. Do you believe that's true? Yeah, did the numbers? I counted it. It's always it been more a third. than that. It was more than that. Claver was way more than that. I mean. Name, name, name the number of, of conservative committee chairs. Well, there were, there were a few. Anybody in the Freedom Party? There were Caucus, none. Was, there were none. I, and there, there were, were, there were, there no, were, there were no white chairs. I'm just talking about the ones that absolutely had D's behind their names. There are those, of course, that, you know, the Zerwasses and, 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 and the likes that we know uh, might as well, uh, that Sarah Davis is whatever, might as well be D's. But as far as actually being named committee chairs or vice chairs, if, since he took the gavel, it was generally, with, without exception, a third, at least in those committees. I don't know about subcommittees and special committees and all that stuff like that. Right. No, what's, well, the real, and, what's the real story, Steve? 
I, I think it'll be better. I really do think it'll be better. And, and I think Dennis knows that from day one, if, you know, when they started uh, um, appointing committees and making promises to in, in folks towards the end of January, early February, I think it's, <clears throat> that, that's really going to, that's going to be the, the acid test for us right, right up front as to whether or not this is going to be a fair and equitable session for us. Okay, so let's get back to the relationship thing. Maybe we should talk about grace a little bit. When your constituents are trying to communicate with you, perhaps it's fair for us to take in consideration the avalanche of legislation that you have to consider. Right. Typically, what is it, Steve? Five to 6,000 bills are actually yeah. filed. Five, uh, 1,500 on, on average get to the floor and actually make it to the governor's desk in which usually less than 40 actually get vetoed. Um, anybody that watches from the gallery of the Texas House of Representatives is like a house getting framed. The gavel is going down right. so fast. Um, a little grace sometimes. In that, in that vein, do you rely on us? Because there's no yes. way I can't. Yes. I, I, I'll tell you. Legislative staff can't keep up with it. Do you rely on us to say, hey, this bill is coming up, Steve. I don't know if you know if it's coming up. We need you to vote down. <laughs> or this amendment is coming up. We need you to vote down on this. Yeah. So um, there aren't enough people. You know, you, you try and put reading groups together to read through bills. You try and rely on floor reports. There, there, are, there are probably six or seven different organizations that put floor reports out for you to look at. Um, I was part of the Republican Caucus uh, um, 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 Legislative Advisory Committee, and there was a, a group of us that met every morning to look at the bills that were coming to the floor. And um, we didn't, you, you don't physically have the time to look at every single bill. And so we would, we'd have reading groups that would put, you know, a hot list of about um, 80 bills that we're going to look at that day. And, and so that we're going to vote on that day. And we would put a recommendation out to the, the folks, um, to the Republicans about how they should be voting. But I got news for you, man, you, you still don't have time to look at everything. And so as an example, the bill I talked to you earlier that, that the Texas Association of Business put forward in the 83rd, um, I didn't see that bill. I, uh, I heard about it from a Democrat that that bill was coming. And, and um, but I'll tell you, there've been a bunch, there were a bunch of other bills that people called my office and said, Hey, have you seen this bill? And um, it, it's very, it is, it's helpful. You guys can be an incredible resource to the legislature. Isn't that dangerous? Because even with the greatest intentions, someone that we know um, has been a champion of, uh, life, liberty, and, and, and prosperity since uh, before public office, the mistake can be made. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You've, um, um, we, we need your help. It, 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 um, there, you know, I have a staff of... Something can I, slip through. Just, just because, just I've, because got a, of I've got a chief of staff and I've got basically two legislative directors. And even though Texas... Um, the way we draft bills, it's completely different than the way they do it in Washington, D.C. So we actually take, if it's a civil code issue, we'll, we'll take it out of, the, out of the civil jurisprudence and we'll actually take the, le the language in the statute and that's the bill. And so it's very, it's very easy to understand, but th there is just so many pieces of legislation that we need all the help that we can get. We just, we do. Steve, November 6th, man. Um, well, even more poignant, November 7th, uh, the last few minutes that we have left in the conversation. I, I, I want to get your thoughts uh, about where we are in the political landscape because of your on the ground experience running multiple campaigns as a volunteer, as a public office holder, a diver diverse resume. It wasn't good here in Texas. Most of big national corporate media focused on the results of Washington Devil City, but here in Texas, we've we've lost some ground and the numbers don't portend a great future. Now, I'd like to go through some of those numbers with you 
Uh, you may already sure. be familiar with them. But first of all, just your 30,000 foot view of when you woke up uh, to get your breakfast on Wednesday the 7th, what was your, your thoughts? Not real surprised. I, look at, I looked at the polling information that, um, that had been coming out for weeks from several different sources. And you knew that the polling was going to be off by virtue of the fact that they had, typically they'd have Abbott up by 21 points and Cruz up by three points. And you know that there can't be that kind of delta among voters between those that are going to support Abbott versus those that will support Cruz. And um, I, I guess I had thought that Q, Cruz's numbers would be higher. I, didn't, I, knew, I, I knew that Abbott wouldn't win by 21, but I thought he'd win by, I thought he'd win by 18 or 15. And so um, I was right in that there, there was only about a three point delta between Abbott and Cruz, but um, I was shocked that, that um, the overall support for Republicans was as low as it was. But honestly, as you start thinking about promises made, promises not kept, I'm not surprised that, that um, we just didn't do as well as we did. So um, you look, I mean, Claver, look what happened with Pete Flores down at, what was that, SD19? What, was, was Pete yeah. SD19? Yeah. Down there in Bear well, County. Pete, hadn't hadn't had, held that office in 130, 39 years or something yeah, like that. Yeah, basically it. since Reconstruction, Texas, right? This, the he, went, he went down there with a very clear message. Border security, pro-life, um, pro-family, <clears throat> very strong Second Amendment message. Um, and um, he didn't win by a little, he won by a lot. And for a special election, it was an unbelievable, it was an unbelievable turnout. The numbers were very high. And so, you know, here's the deal. When, when, when people with uh, um, a Hispanic heritage um, turn out and vote Republican at any time it's north of 40%, we win and we win big. My message is, as long as Republicans continue to be fearful of the platform, as long as they fail to boldly, as Ronald Reagan talked about, bold colors, not, not dull pastels, but bold, when, we, when we are bold and we embrace the platform, we win big. When we just talk about the platform and then go to Austin and don't follow through on it, we lose big. Uh, okay. All right, Steve. I sort of agree with that. I sort of disagree with that. This is going to be fun. Okay. Let's have sure. fun. Okay. All right. So the thing that caught my eye was the growth of the total votes cast. In 2010, that was the seminal election, the Tea Party election. Okay, uh, in 2009, when Strauss was elected speaker, the balance of power, 76-74 GOP. After that 2010 election in 2011, we had a supermajority one-on-one, one-on-one right. 49, okay? Okay, but since 2010, the total number of votes that have ca been cast in Texas has gone from 4.98, just under 5 million, to 8.33 in this midterm at a high point of just under 9 million. The number of people voting in Texas has actually exceeded the population growth in Texas. And most of that is going to Democrats. I mean, I have further numbers, I have further numbers to point that out, but just <laughs> that vote growth total in eight years. Is there an explanation? Yeah, I, I, I again, I don't, I don't, it, in my mind, if we don't embrace what we really truly believe and give people a reason to vote for something, um, in the absence of believing in the platform, they're going to go towards people that believe in their platform. The Democrats really believe in their platform and they're but excited about it. But does it have to be uniform? Because, because in this 2018 election, regardless of where the Republicans were in the political spectrum, I mean, we Matt Rinaldi went down. I mean, you had, you had people that came from different points of the political spectrum on so the Republican I, side. I, I would contend down. that I would contend that if this was if this is twenty um, eighteen 
Don Huffines went down. Connie Burton went Connie, down. Yep, those yeah. hurt. Those yeah. hurt. Those hurt so deep. Those were, but Claver, those were Orvises that were around 50%, give or take a, a few points, right? right. Um, I, I think we should have been shocked to see a guy like Ron Simmons go down where his Orvis was up around 59, optimal Republican voting strength was up around 59 or 60%. But yes, to to I, you know I are, 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 the, are the ones that barely escaped uh, yeah. um, Shaheen and uh, um, you know, like, so like you know Big Stick said hey hey he he literally said I I, I was you know working for Rinaldi and I wasn't watching my own district he didn't get fifty percent you know right. a lot of you know uh, Krauss barely made it and uh, it was a lot of close calls it could have been worse yeah but you know if you look at my district as an, as an example. Um, it mirrors a lot of the Tarrant and Denton County districts, and yet I won with 63%, um, a strong, and so here's the deal. I think we can't take it for granted anymore that people are just going to turn out and vote for us. You've got to get out and you've got to work. You've, you've got to go out and you've got to knock on doors. And um, again, we're in this thing to win hearts and minds. And if we're not actively trying to win hearts and minds, and we just think that people are just going to show up and vote. We're, we're delusional, grossly delusional. I think that if, if this was 2020 and, um, and uh, um, it was a presidential year, I think Matt Rinaldi would have won. I think Connie would have won. I think Don would have won. I'm not so sure about that, Steve. I'm not. Okay. And, and I, I don't want this to be a debate because I'm trying to get to a point here I, I, because I think there is, there's a priority that the party in each individual campaign should be pointed towards. And I think the numbers will prove me, prove me to, to, to be correct. But the fall off between the 2018 presidential election and the 2016 midterm election was only 650,000 votes. Granted, usually a midterm mm -hmm. fall off is in the 40%, 50%. Right. Uh, right. and, 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 and the Republican votes did increase, and there was very little Republican fall off. Republicans did show up. It's all these Democrats. That showed that, up for the very first time. That, that right. showed up for the very first time, correct? Okay. Um, my point is this. I just don't believe with the demographic changes that we have in Texas, with the Caucasian population now at 42%, okay, that we can continue to believe the party can squeeze out more Caucasian votes, especially. No, Clay, I, I agree with you. I'm not, you and I aren't going to disagree on that at all. But I, I just believe Steve, that it has to be a priority from top to bottom of the party, each individual campaign and candidate and office holder. It has to be number one. It is our number one. And, and Clay, I would just say this when, when we prioritize reaching out evangelism work, um, especially Claver, especially on the border. And let, and let me just give you a quick example of that. I, I, I had my, my, my comptroller for my little company. She's from far Texas. It's, it's eight miles North of the border. And back in 2013, she was getting married and my daughter was in the wedding and, and my wife and I were going to go to the wedding in far and a week and a half before the wedding, she said, with tears in her eyes, she goes, you guys can't come to the wedding. And I said, you're what, why? Um, and she goes, um, she said, I'll be worried about you the whole time that you're down there. Mm -hmm. And um, so that, that's a hundred miles from the border, by the way, eight, far as eight miles from the border. Yeah, wait, what I'm talking about is uh... far Texas is like eight miles from the border. Yeah. Okay. All right. So anyways, all so, right. It, so anyways, I call up Steve McGraw, head of Texas DPS, and I said, Steve, I said, I told him the story, and he goes, oh, representative, you said, you'll be perfectly safe down there. I said, that's what I thought. And he said, we'll have a car on you the whole time you're there. <laughs> <laughs> right? And I'm like, you're not taking somebody off the border to watch me. And he goes, well, he said, it's, you know, we need to do that to keep, make sure that you'll be okay. And so I didn't go, but you know, the reality is that Hispanics that, you know, she's a sixth generation American or Texan and, and she, she wants the same thing that you and I want and her parents and her kids want the same thing that you and I want. We want a safe place to send our kids to school 
and, and, and get a job. We're not looking for any handouts. We're just looking for an opportunity to live free and raise our family in a safe place. Uh, Trump, but you know what? We're not taking that message. Trump won, the, Trump won the border counties of Texas. Very few people. Absolutely. Look at El Paso. Why? Cruz had the worst campaign manager, director. Trump won New Aces. Trump won Jefferson County. Think of this for a second, Claver. El Paso was one of the most dangerous places in all of Texas. There was no city more dangerous than El Paso. And what happened? El Paso went and built a fence a wall, and it became one of the safest cities in Texas. And yet here we, but Beto, when he was on the city council there, he got a free pass. We shouldn't be building walls, we should be building bridges, Beto said, yet that was never used um, against him. I, I, the, the messaging, ridiculous. we absolutely agree on. The problem is, is that the resources and the effort by the party and the individual campaigns aren't being made. We're not going to have an argument that our point of view is their point of view. Right. The argument becomes, how do we get people up in Austin, especially within the party, to get off of their derrieres, put resources, human and financial behind it, and make it happen? If we don't, we will not win elections, Steve. And I think James Dickey needs to make an argument to um, the RNC in Washington that this is the deal. You lose Texas and you lose the United States. You will never see, you'll never see another Republican in the White House if we lose Texas. And that means right now we're going to have to match what the DNC, the Democrat National Committee, is doing to win Texas. They're pouring they're not, they're not just pouring millions, they're pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into the state to turn it blue, which means that the Republican Party, the Republican National Committee, as well as the Republican, uh, the state of Texas Republican Committee is going to have to get really serious. We're going to have to get deadly serious about, uh, about winning hearts and minds. And, and, and here's the deal. We know. It's, it's, it's not anecdotal. It's empirical. We know that when you reach out and you go and you show up that they'll vote. They'll vote with us. They will vote with us. The exit, the exit polling number says that, and, and we're doing reports on that, Steve. Right. And I'll make sure that you get the links on that because the exit polling shows that they are with us on the issues and there's some low hanging fruit that the right. party should be taking advantage it's exciting, of. exciting, man. I'm not Let's, discouraged about it. I'm excited about it. It's just well, we have we, to do it, though, Steve. We That's do have to do it, and we, and we have to put the pressure on the leadership. We have to do a pincer movement. Sure, the grassroots can put pressure on the SREC or on the chair, but you also, as the office holders, you're the ones that rely on the votes to stay in office. You got to put the pressure on them as well. It has to be done. Yeah. There's nothing. There's, there's no escaping it. There's no more escaping it anymore. The demographic numbers are what they are. We're forced to do it, and, it, and the party is going to be better for it. Now, let's get finally, the last few minutes that we have, talk to me about 2019. What do you expect the Republican Conference or Caucus priorities to be? What are you going to be focusing on? What do you think is going to get done? I, I think we, we, we um, really have to focus on some key issues. I think we do need to focus on, on school finance reform. And we've got to focus on property tax reform. And the, and the two are tied up with one another. Um, states like California, um, New York, and Texas, um, we put a huge burden on the, on property tax, on, on, on the property tax to fund our schools. And so in those states, in Texas, two-thirds of funding for education comes from the local property tax owner. Right, or the local local property owner, and only a third comes from the state. We've got to flip that. So that means, and I've been working on something with um, with Terry, um, 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 our pa our pistol packing pastor, um, <laughs> that is an SD four. Terry Holcomb, Terry yeah. Holcomb, the open and, carry preacher. Yes. So Terry and I are working on some legislation to switch the maintenance and operation back to the state of Texas. We eventually want to get to the point where 100% of maintenance and operation is paid for at the state level. And something good happens when you do that, because right now the state of Texas is pointing at the ISD and they're saying, hey, man, dude, you don't have the money you need because you're not taxing people enough. And then 
ISDs point their finger at the state of Texas and said, you're not giving us enough money. You've got plenty of money. Just give us more money. And at the end of the day, two things need to happen. Number one, it, it needs to be flipped so that maintenance and operations, the vast majority, if not all of it, should come from the state of Texas, number one. When that happens, the state of Texas can look at these ISDs and say, you know what, why are you building water parks instead of paying teachers what they should be paid? Why are you building um, AstroTurf, $60 million AstroTurf football stadiums with message centers, full color message centers when you should be paying classroom teachers? The cost of education index looks at 1,154 ISDs across the state of Texas. Claver, you know how many of those 1,154 schools use their, their classroom funding for 100% of the classroom? Five. That's it. 1,154 schools that should be using their CEI money in the classroom, 100% of it in the classroom, and there are only five that do that. It, that's called corruption, isn't it? It's, it's called malfeasance. It's called corruption. It's called stupidity. I, you, you name it. Dude, well, I don't care what you it's call called, it. It's called Big Ed, the Big Industrial <laughs> Education Complex. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah, I mean, th there are really good schools like CISD, counter Repent School District, actually uses my area, and we actually use 101% of our CEI money in the classroom. And we've got about $30,000 of debt per student. But then you can go up into the Dallas area, North Dallas, and you find, you'll find ISDs up there that has $69,000, $70,000 of debt per student, $80,000 of debt per student. And they, they have multiple campuses. They don't, they don't think about the economy of scale and what a successful business does to do things. These, guys, these individuals talk about these many, many micro campuses where there's an affluence of, uh, or an abundance of, of administrators and, and very few teachers. It's, re it's ridiculous. And all financed by those cabs, those exploding uh, yep, yep. bond debt instruments. Um, they'll be dead and gone and their children and grandchildren they have to deal with the balloon payments. Exactly. Um, you're, you're, now, you are a metropolitan or a suburban state representative. Transportation is a very big issue. The proliferation of toll roads, um, the abridging of our liberty from getting from point A to point B, the high cost of that. What, what are you anticipating from that, Steve? I, I would like to see legislation <clears throat> that basically gives us the freedom that when a road is paid off, the toll goes away. And Claver, even if, even if you give people the opportunity within the district to say, okay, when it's paid off, if you want to drop from $2.25 on or $2.75 on a toll to, to 10 cents to maintain the road. I'm a big believer in, in, in consumption taxes. I don't want an elderly person that doesn't get in the car and drive on a toll road. I don't want them paying for that toll road. I don't want them paying for it to build it. And I don't want them paying for it to maintain it. Well, who's going to pay for it? Well, the people that use it. If, if, you, as a, if you as a county want that toll road, um, then that's your choice. Um, but once it's paid for, the toll needs to come off. And I, I'd say that's the only condition of ever allowing a toll road is the toll needs to go away when it's paid for. Well, that's a function of the, of the system finance, right? That, right. That where the argument now is, okay, so you have this toll road, it is paid for it, but now we need the revenue from it to fund this other toll road. And so it continues to be this spider web, the system financing of this toll road. And, it does, and, and Claver, it doesn't even do that. The money goes into GR. It's, it's used for all these ridiculous pet projects. It's used so that, as an example, in, in Harris County, right? Houston is broke. It's absolutely broke. It's, it's broke ass poor. And, and what, what are they doing? Oh, they're going to spend a couple hundred million dollars renovating a golf course so that the Shell Houston Open comes back inside the loop. How ridiculous is that? They're broke. They can't afford to pay their firefighters. They're looking at laying off police officers and firefighters now because a Prop B passed and they didn't want it to pass. And what are they doing now? All oh, they're going to spend two hundred million dollars on the golf course. It's it's, it's ridiculous. With the transportation issue, you expect some something on that, hopefully. Yep. Yep. 
Yep. And it, and, and education. Yes. Uh, I'm also course. working on, on I, I'm also working on um, legislation to disconnect the link between state legislators retirement and, and district and state judges. So that that's got to stop. Um, um, it, it's ridiculous that w through a stealth means uh, we as legislators can can vote to increase the pay of district and state judges and then that also raises the retirement your, pension, your pensions pension. yeah now I, that's in, I, that's it, in perpetuity by the way in perpetuity but here's the deal i don't think i think the vast majority of people that will serve in the texas legislature i i would gander a guess that 75 percent of them will never get pension it's 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 a small group of 25 percent that you know will serve beyond eight years well the vast majority of people never serve eight years they yeah just, but, then, but, then, but then you get craddock and sinfoni have been there for half a century one know, last and, and they've got a sweet they've got a sweet retirement what, what that's they have hundred ninety thousand dollars it'll pay them more deal. money than abbott and you get up there for 20 years and it's 60 it's 60 g forever and ever amen one, one last thing one last thing for you steve uh that came across the chat room uh in the last minute in le legislation dealing with the alamo Yes, sir. On the Alamo, any, any legislation on the Alamo? Yeah, so a, a number of us, I, I reached out to the Attorney General's office and asked, could we eminent domain the Alamo from the, from the city of San Antonio? And the word came back, yes, absolutely can. Um, that we whoa, as a whoa, legislature- whoa, whoa, Wait, 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 did you send a press release out on this or is this breaking news? No, it, I mean, it, um, a number of us are working on it, um, and so I. How long ago was this, Steve? I reached out to Paxson's office three three months ago, and they said that you could we could eminent domain the cenotaph. You and several other state representatives, or just your own solo initiative? My solo initiative, but Kyle Biederman, I think, is going to be the one that's going to carry the legislation. So, I, and I, I'm not speaking for Kyle. I just know that they're looking at a lot of different solutions to protect it to protect the cenotaph, um, what one, I'm gonna work, I'm gonna do what I can to help Kyle. He's, he's done the heavy lifting on it and um, I don't wanna um, step on his toes, but I'm gonna, whatever Kyle agrees to do, I, I think you know, we need to get behind one person that's done the heavy lifting on this issue and I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna help him. And the ultimate goal of the legislation is to be able to use eminent domain away from the city of San Antonio to protect the, to protect the Alamo. Correct. Correct. And I'd, I'd really like to see us take it out of the hands of the G GLO as well. I don't, I don't think it belongs there. I think, I don't think um, Junior's done a, a real good job. Are, nice you familiar, guy. are you familiar with the comments that former land commissioner Jerry Patterson has made yes. uh, dealing with the con uh, dealing with the conduct of uh, commissioner Bush? Yeah, it's, it's, I, I'm, um, and I don't want to get into his rhetoric, but I'm disappointed with with what what has happened. What's well, his happened. rhetoric is his rhetoric is incendiary, but are the charges are are the allegations fair? fair? Yeah. Okay. I um, mean, you know, look, as a statewide elected official, I, I feel like he's been tone deaf um, to what we've asked for. And, and members of the Freedom Caucus met with him, and he made promises that he didn't follow through on. And that's, that's all very disappointing. Do you believe that the majority of the uh, Republican caucus is in favor of doing something about the Alamo? And, and I do. I definitely do. And in fact, I, I think you're going to find, Claver, that you're going to find a lot of Democrats that will really? support us on this as well. None of them, none of them from San Antonio. Of course. I, I think that there are some good, good folks, even on the Democrat side, that want to see us preserve and um, De defend that sacred ground. I mean, it's just, there's no supporting what, what, um, what um, George has done. No, hey, hey, that's a positive note to end on, Steve. Fantastic. Uh, just uh, really quickly for uh, anyone that wants to get in contact with you and do precisely what you've asked them to do, keep you informed of what is important to them. Um, yeah. How can they get in contact with you, Steve? Steve at Steve Toth for Texas dot com 
And um, I've given my cell phone number out to to um, nearly 15,000 of my closest friends here in the district. It's oh, 281. Two, that is not smart. That's no, not. I'm telling you, I've had a good experience with it. So I do this all the time. 281-770-7287. And if you're respectful and kind and courteous, you're free to call me. Okay? Oh. Prayers. Hey, Kramer, I did it. I did it. I did it when I was in session last time. Worked great. I maybe get 15, Pray. 20 calls a week. That's about it. Prayers for him, Lord. Prayers. <laughs> I, I would love that. Yes. Definitely. State Representative Steve Toth. It's fantastic to have him back under the pink dome. He is one of the liberty driven state representatives. We really missed him when he wasn't there. It's great to have him back. His compass is pointed in the right direction life, liberty, and prosperity. And he's out of the woodlands. Um, he's a great guy, loves the Lord Jesus Christ, fantastic family man. Yeah. And uh, so keep your eye on Steve Toth. It's great to have him back. Um, just real quick, Saints and Patriots, I want to remind you that this conversation and all the conversations we've previously had during the Texas Nationalist Movement's legislation, Legislative Act, Action Workshop, it is archived on video. The main website page, once again, the main website hub, tnm.me slash tnm law law4 legislative action workshop tnm.me slash tnm law and as soon as you log on you'll see the red button there that says watch video all the conversations are archived right there and they're all fantastic an international um uh, list of panelists and uh, the conversations tonight uh, wrapping up with the big stick Jonathan Sticklin and Steve Toth could not absolutely have been better but we do want you to go check out those videos you f share them please or if you have the ability to edit them the portions that you like and distribute in a fashion that you believe is going to be uh, good for educating and uh, educating the electorate do so please do so we, we, we would like for you to do that Finally, please download the Raging Elephants Radio app. You can find it in your app store or in Google Play. We attempt to be a trustworthy news source, commentary, and opinion from a liberty perspective. Yes, we're biased. Um, once again, thanks to Texas Nationalist Movement, Daniel Carey, and everybody at the mothership over in Nederland, the TNM HQ. We do have one more conversation planned. It's not locked in as of yet with State Senator Brandon Creighton. But uh, watch your inbox for that confirmation to happen. Thank you once again for joining us. I'm Apostle Claver T. Kamau Imani, the Christian politician, your ultra conservative soul brother. My enemies under the pink dome call me the purifier, and I like it. From Houston, may the Lord Jesus bless you. May the Lord Jesus bless the future independent, sovereign Republic of Texas.